We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Okay, so thank you very much for your patience um, in waiting. I would now like to start the session so that we can deep dive into our topic of today. Um, first of all, dear speakers, dear participants, a very warm welcome to our session. My name is Vanessa Dreyer. I'm a UNESCO Associate Expert for Digital Innovation and Transformation, and I will be the moderator for this open forum on artificial intelligence and the rule of law. Um, kindly note that this discussion will be recorded. And if you have any questions during the session, please type them in the chat. There will be a question and answer session at the end, and we will address a selection of the questions raised throughout. Uh, to kick off, I will hand the floor to my UNESCO colleague Pratik on our work in the field of AI and digital transformation, and then hand over to our partners of the project, setic.br, before introducing our panelists. Pratik is the AI project lead in UNESCO's section on digital innovation and transformation. So Pratik, the floor is yours. Thanks, thanks Vanessa and hello everyone. I'll be pretty quick and brief. So I uh, just wanted to introduce some of the work that UNESCO has been doing in this field over the past 10 years. Um, UNESCO has trained about 23,000 judicial operators worldwide. Uh, some of you are here, so thanks for joining us today. Uh, some of you are speakers as well today, so thank you again for that. Uh, so our program has worked around 150 countries and has trained uh, judicial operators on questions related to freedom of expression, access to information, and safety of journalists. And in 2020, actually, at the Athens Roundtable, which is also happening now, uh, we, uh, we came up with the idea, along with all the participants, to venture into the domain of AI. And uh, hence, we started working on a MOOC. And uh, as part of this work, we have developed four pillars. First is UNESCO is going to develop institutional partnerships with regional and national courts, as well as international associations of judges and prosecutors to foster uh, democracy and the rule of law. Second, uh, we'll be supporting national schools of judges and prosecutors to strengthen their capacities through modalities like train the trainers. Third, we will, as part of the judges initiative, we've built already comprehensive toolkits, which include MOOCs, uh, curriculum, as well as uh, regular webinars and on the ground trainings, which we will also be doing for AI and the rule of law. And finally, uh, there is a technology dimension, which is uh, these technologies offer a opportunity to strengthen access to justice, but also smoothen administration of justice. So we'll be working on the tech aspect as well uh, through repositories and uh, common, common sources. Uh, I will stop here and really looking forward to the discussion and the insights. And from our experiences before, I think it's always helpful to engage as we develop this program further with you. So thank you so much and look forward to the discussion. Over to you, Vanessa. Thank you very much, Pratik. Um, and let me now just hand over the floor to Ana Laura, who is coordinator of technical cooperation at CETIC.br. Ana Laura, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Vanessa. And it's really a pleasure for me to represent the Regional Center for Studies on the Development of the Information Society, CEDIC.br, at the Brazilian Network Information Center, NIC.br, in the opening of this forum, which brings key discussions on artificial intelligence and the rule of law to this Internet Governance Forum. Uh, we at CEDIC.br didn't hesitate in partnering partnering with UNESCO for supporting this event, as well for developing the MOOC devoted to this matter, which will take place next year. As will be discussed in more detail today, AI-based systems open multiple possibilities for the rule of law, but they also pose ethical challenges that need to be addressed. 
In this context, producing reliable data is crucial for providing a solid understanding of how AI is being used in the judiciary, essential to maximize its benefits and to mitigate its risks. AI measurement efforts are essential for informing stakeholders and guiding the development, implementation, and monitoring of AI policies, but they face some challenges. On the one hand, AI technologies are developing at a very fast pace, which makes the very conceptualization and operationalization uh, of such concepts a complex endeavor. Additionally, measurability, measurability of AI is a challenge not only because it is not a standalone technology, but also because it is often embedded in such a way that it becomes invisible. Um, it is fundamental that a wide range of data providers work collabora collaboratively to produce relevant data on the use of digital technologies in general and on AI in the judiciary in particular. This should not be an isolated effort, but one made within a multi-stakeholder ecosystem following commonly agreed uh, frameworks which allow for international comparability and in compliance with personal data protection regulations. Monitoring and evaluation should also account for to what extent AI is being used and adopted ethically in the judiciary. Measuring the adoption of AI is indeed a complex task but nonetheless essential to inform stakeholders and guide public policy design. We at CEDIC.br hope that bringing this issue to the table, including it within the MOOC and in debates like today's, will help bridge the gap between research and adoption of AI so that its economic, social, cultural, and political implications are better monitored, understood, and addressed. We wish all of you an excellent discussion and a fruitful exchange in this forum, and we hope to see you in the MOOC next April. Thank you, Vanessa. Over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you both for your opening words and introduction to your work and why it is important to build capacities of judicial operators on the impacts of digital technologies and artificial intelligence on justice systems. So judicial systems worldwide are already using AI for a variety of tasks. They help lawyers, for example, to identify precedents in case law. They enable administrations in streamlining judicial processes. And they also support judges with predictions on issues, including sentence duration, recidivism scores, and even decision making. Um, so as part of UNESCO's Global Judges Initiative and in partnership with the Future Society, um, UNESCO is launching its first massive open online course on AI and the rule of law with the aim to really engage judicial operators in a global and timely discussion around AI's impact and implications in upholding the rule of law. So this open forum uh, will host renowned judges, lawyers and representatives of international organizations from around the world to share insights on the challenges and the good practices adopted in their jurisdictions concerning the use of AI and the legal implications of AI for society from a human rights perspective. It is therefore my pleasure now to introduce you to our speakers of the session. First of all, welcome Katrin Forrest, Kravath Swain and Moore partner, and also a former United States district judge for the Southern District of New York. Welcome. Welcome Isabella Ferrari, federal judge at the second regional federal court of Brazil. Welcome to Benes Aldana, president of the National Judicial College in the United States. Welcome to Edward Asante, president of the Economic Community of West African States, the Community Court of Justice. And welcome also to Nicola Mialje, co-founder and president of the Future Society and also host of the Athens Roundtable on AI and the rule of law that is happening in parallel to IGF. Thank you all very much for joining today. So let's jump into our discussion with our first question. Why do we focus on AI and the rule of law? And why has it become such an important topic? Nicola, may I ask you to start? As co-partner in the Massive Open Online course on AI and the rule of law, what is the future society's interest at the intersection of AI and the rule of law? 
And what gap are you aiming to close with our joint course? Over to you, Nicola. Thanks a lot, Vanessa, and, and, and nice to see so many friendly faces today. It's about capacity building, you said it. Capacity building, capacity building, capacity building. But what gaps are we trying to close there? At least gaps evolving in two dimensions. One is a gap in moving from education to training and equipping judges and judicial operators with first a common understanding of what AI and the rule of law, AI for the rule of law, and the rule of law for AI means. And then moving from a, a, a basic understanding to like a more expertise training, including in using and mobilizing the tools and algorithmic processing across uh, cases and, and situations in criminal and civilian justice. It's, it's first about that. But it's also about equipping them with the capacity to bridge the gap from principles to practice. What does that mean? When you look at the good governance of the AI that is emerging, it has to be the result of cocktails and smart cocktails of self, soft, and hard regulatory mechanisms. And at the end of the day, the results and how these mechanisms are adjudicated over eventually in a large way fall on the table of the judges. So it's about really equipping them to do their job well across a number of local contexts. But it's also about recognizing that next to the adjudicatory route, there are other routes through which AI is governed, the regulatory routes and the administrative routes. And so it's really important to help judicial operators and citizens situate themselves within this emerging uh, governance of AI regime. So that's the kind of gap we're trying to close. And, and this MOOC is the first step in that direction. And as we move forward and instruments get developed and tools get developed, it's going to be very important to keep on closing the gap from education to training and from AI governance principles to practice as they apply to the rule of law. Thank you very much, Nicola. That was super interesting already. Um, Venus Aldana, as you are leading a training institution in the United States, may I ask you, what is the specific need that you see in training judicial operators on challenges of emerging technologies and specifically AI? Thank you, Vanessa, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. As you pointed out, the digital revolution has uh, gradually insinuated a variety of technologies into daily human interactions, and more recently, AI is beginning to displace certain human activities. So legal disputes surrounding AI are therefore inevitable, and judges need to have both the training, uh, as Nicholas said, the capacity on understanding the legal and ethical implications of this technology. Take, for example, the emerging use of AI in medicine. This can be expected to give rise to multiple malpractice scenarios, including misdiagnosis or incorrect diagnosis, improper treatment recommendation, leading to bad outcomes, privacy concerns, occasioned by wrongful disclosure of confidential patient information, perhaps even emotional distress caused by faulty diagnosis, and potential discrimination issues that could arise, for example, where AI is prioritizing the allocation of limited medical resources for patient care. Uh, there are other areas. Um, how, how do defamation laws apply uh, to AI-generated speech? Uh, what ground rules should be in place as we use AI tools to assist sentencing? Uh, what do hyper-realistic fake videos mean for the rules of evidence? So all these legal implications and those ethical implications as, as well. And I know that uh, outside the United States, um, particularly in Europe, uh, are more advanced in trying to uh, develop principles to, to gov govern uh, some of the use of AI, particularly in the judiciary. And I know that in, in Europe, uh, principles have been established to ensure, um, to address fundamental human rights and protection, privacy uh, protections. So again, the challenge uh, for the judiciary uh, will be um, challenging our most fundamental understanding or commitments to fairness and due process, and even an, our understanding of, uh, of, of truth. And so uh, the judiciary, I think, plays an important role in guiding this uh, conversation. And as uh, Nicholas pointed out, the Athens Rain Table is going on right now. For me, in the last three years of engagement with the Athens Roundtable, the Future Society, UNESCO, I2PRLE, 
I think the most important message about, about AI is that the future paths of AI are neither predetermined nor beyond our influence. And so that is the reason I think we continue to have bring the stakeholders together and engage in this conversation. And the judiciary needs to be part of it. Uh, at least in the United States, the judiciary sometimes is behind and with the National Judicial College is take, uh, doing its part to make sure that uh, it's um, uh, ahead and um, you know able to uh, take advantage of uh, understanding these issues as AI continue to influence uh, all our activities. Thank you very much. This was an interesting first round already. I would now like to deep dive into AI in the judiciary and specific use cases of AI in the justice system. Uh, Isabella Ferrari, could you introduce us to the AI system, Victor? What is the importance of the AI system, Victor, in the Brazilian justice system? And what are the main risks you foresee? Over to you, Isabella. Thank you. Of course, Vanessa, thank you so much. And I'd like to start saying that it's a pleasure to be here. So Victor is the Brazilian Supreme Court AI decision assistant. Um, from what I know, Victor is the only AI tool embedded in a Supreme Court in the world. And to understand the potentials and also the risks that Victor poses, we need to understand a little bit about what it does and about the Brazilian environment, the Brazilian unique litigation environment, I would say so. So in Brazil, we have a caseload of around 80 million lawsuits and it's one lawsuit for each 2.6 inhabitants, it's a lot. And the appeals field to the Brazilian Supreme Court recently are around 60,000 each year. And the Brazilian Supreme Court rules around 120,000 appeals each year. So when we saw this environment and this caseload, and we, when we had to decide how we would deal with that, what was done in my country was to establish the electronic lawsuit. It, it, we have electronic lawsuits since 2010. So it's not something that came with the pandemics. And then we also established a requisite of appeal to the Brazilian Supreme Court that is called general repercussion. What is general repercussion? It's the requirements that to take a case to the Supreme Court, you need to have social relevance of that appeal. So Victor helps us to see what has and what does not has general repercussion. This activity of saying it has, it does not have, or we don't know if it has, and the Supreme Court needs to, to address this lawsuit to see if there is or not general repercussion because it hasn't been already decided. This was a human activity of the Brazilian Supreme Court civil servants, and they used to take 44 minutes to do so. This is something that Victor is doing now in around five seconds. So the stagnant activity is being done by Victor in five seconds. But besides saying if the lawsuit has or does not have, or if you don't know if the lawsuit has general repercussion, after being trained with a lot of decisions that were taken previously by the Supreme Court. Another thing that Victor does is ossears, it ossears the lawsuit. What means that it reads the images and understands what is there. Another problem that Brazilian Supreme Court has is that it receives lawsuits from all the Brazilian courts. State, we have state courts, we have federal courts, we have military courts, we have electoral courts, we have labor courts. And these files that comes to the Brazilian Supreme Court, they come in, in different ways, PDFs, images, etc. So for the, the civil servants, they don't take 44 minutes just because they are trying to reason and understand the requisite. It's also because they need to find themselves and to find important documents in that lawsuit, and it takes time. 
So when Victor oceers the lawsuit, it also reorganizes the lawsuit and tags the most important parts of it, the most important decisions, which is wonderful. And it makes the lives of those who have to deal with that lawsuit later easier. But at the same time, we have a super AI tool that is really understanding everything that's happening in all the Brazilian courts, in all lawsuits, from the beginning to its end. So it's a superpower. And every superpower comes with big risks. What I would say specifically about Victor, the risks that Victor poses are some things. First of all, when we use this tool, as it's still being tested in Brazil, the parties are not advised. They don't know that Victor has been used in their lawsuit. And if they don't know, they can appeal from that specific situation. And some people say, some people respond to this critic saying that it's not relevant because Victor just makes a suggestion and then a civil servant has to, 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 to agree with that suggestion. But the point is that for all of those who have studied a little bit about algorithmic bias, this is something. So what is algorithmic bias? It's the bias that we human have that make us tend to agree with a decision that was suggested by a machine because we feel that that decision is scientific, is more trustable, it's trustworthy. And the reality is that even if we have a mathematical basis in the algorithms, they learned based on data and the data is produced in our bias society. So many times the suggestion that algorithmics make in all the sectors of our lives, they have nothing to do with science. They're much more human than anything else. So the first critic is we are unaware when this tool is used, so we can't appeal from that. And we have algorithmic bias. So the answer that, so the, the response to that, that we have a human in the loop is not enough. It does not solve our problem. And, and I think that these are like the two biggest points of attention not being formed when the tool is used and also the point of algorithmic bias that is not something that comes only with Victor, but it's something that is bigger and that must always be in our minds when we talk about using algorithms to decide. Yeah, thank you very much for raising this important point. And I'm very happy to share that one of the six modules that is actually being part of the MOOC is addressing algorithmic bias and the digital divide because it's indeed one of the biggest challenges when applying probably any digital te technology to justice systems. So yeah, thank you very much for flagging this. Um, let me direct the discussion towards the impact of AI on the rule of law and related challenges or let's continue that path, so to say as well. Um, Benus Aldana, as president of the National Judicial College, could you maybe identify two critical challenges for AI in the judicial role that you see, um, maybe adding on uh, what Isabella has just shared? Yeah, so I think um, the first one, uh, as Judge Ferrari has already mentioned, that's algorithmic bias uh, in the United States. Uh, we have a couple of cases that that has become uh, an, an issue. Um, and so um, I think that continues to develop here and, uh, and trying to gain a better understanding on how to make sure that uh, those tools we use uh, for pre-sentencing and post-sentencing are, um, or in, in the courtroom in general, uh, are, are fair. The second is in the area of autonomous, uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, the, uh, um, involving injuries and deaths. Um, I think those are complex uh, legal questions in tort and criminal law and uh, issues of causation arising from faulty AI decision making um, involving uh, motorists. It's gonna challenge judges um, in terms of identifying who the responsible party is, uh, the owner of the machine that's manufactured 
software developers and various contributors that input data into those decision algor uh, um, algorithms. So that's one area um, that uh, we're trying to educate our judges on. But I think the, uh, the, the first part that Judge Farah had already mentioned is probably the most critical uh, piece uh, in, in terms of making sure that we have a handle on it, so. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, maybe just to reiterate on that, um, Isabella, may I just give you the floor again, um, because I found your aspects now very interesting as well and would like to elaborate more on, could you maybe share your insight? What do you believe to be the most challenging human rights issues, maybe for the Brazilian case um, for now, considering AI deployment in the judicial system? I always think that we need to take a look at the situation and take a decision regarding the situation that you live. So in Brazil, we have a situation that people sometimes they have a lawsuit that takes 30 years to be ruled, 35 years to be ruled. And justice that takes that long is not justice at all. So I'm a really, I'm really an enthusiast of online dispute resolution systems and online courts and AI tools to help us judges in doing our work and doing um, what we need to do. But a point is that um, I really want that we advance in this topic, but advance in a safe way. We need to be sure that we're heading to the right point. And at the same time that I think that technology can help us foster some of the rule of law values like accessibility, like everything that, that has to do with this world, we need to be sure that the two biggest risks when using technology, especially AI tools are addressed. And the two biggest risks are the opacity that is inherent to this kind of tool and the possible discrimination. So I think that this kind of discussion that we're having here, it's really, really important because at the same time that we shouldn't stop progress and at the same time that I think that at least in a legal system like the Brazilian one where we have so many problems and where technology can help us with those problems, at the same time that we shouldn't close this door, we need to be sure that we are in the right path. So I think like I think that these dis discussions are very important to guide us to this path. Thank you very much. I'm happy now that we start the discussion. I see Nicola has, has raised his hand and we already have the first question in the chat. So Nicolas, firstly to you, and then I will pick up the question from the chat. Thank you. Well, let me take this, uh, this question from a different angle, anchored in a use case, civilian, electronic discovery. What we want to avoid, as an example, is that AI become weaponized to favor uh, the powerful. We know that in some cases, mobilizing electronic discovery is going to be difficult and will favor entrenched interests of the most powerful. So PIT, for example, large corporation versus a small uh, enterprise. How do we ensure through uh, facilitation of uh, available to all open source benchmarking protocols, we create a situation when, where judges can facilitate reconciliation of a negotiation between two opposing parties to avoid weaponization of the negotiation that is going to eventually favor the most powerful. So uh, creating these benchmarking protocols, creating the tools uh, to uh, facilitate the work of judges to create a level playing field and to maximize due process and access to justice is something that is extremely important on the criminal side, of course, but also on the civilian side. And it's a question of practical tools, instruments, standards, particularly benchmarking standards, to really equip the judges to, in a way, avoid their dockets being used or misused for weaponization of negotiations, as an example. Thank you very much. And maybe that is adding very well to the question that was shared by Sami Carol in the chat. Um, at you, Benes Aldana. How exactly are you edu educating the judges concerning, for example, autonomous vehicles? Do you have examples on how that is possible to actually transfer knowledge to judges on implications 
of AI and case laws on AI um, through the networks that you have? Yeah, so uh, the National Judicial College is actually located on the University of Nevada, Reno, uh, in uh, Reno, Nevada. And we have uh, a, a pretty robust uh, um, uh, department on campus that's dealing with auto autonomous vehicles. Uh, and, 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 and so part of uh, our education is partnering with, uh, with them and also uh, through other institutions in the United States to give judges the background and understanding of, uh, of the technology, one, and um, raising those issues that I've just raised about uh, 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 responsibility and, and fault. And so, um, no, we, we don't have a complete comprehensive, but uh, it, it's a start. Uh, we'd like to include that in, in our um, AI uh, curriculum. We have a week long course uh, this year on artificial intelligence and that particular topic will be one of the things that will be covered. Thank you very much. And maybe I just um, address another question to you, um, Bina Saldana. So um, as you are the leading provider of judicial education in the United States with the National Judicial College, um, how do you think we can expand the reach of the current training on AI and the rule of law? Or where are well, the limits that you see and what needs to be done? Well, uh, I think the uh, UNESCO's effort uh, is a big effort in educating uh, judges and judicial operators around the world. So uh, the National Judicial College is excited to, to partner in, in launching that effort in March. Um, that's a first step. Um, again, as I mentioned here at the National Judicial College, we will have a first week long course on artificial intelligence. We've never had that before here uh, at, at the college, but we also continue to uh, provide uh, webinars uh, uh, throughout the year on different topics involving AI. Um, obviously the pandemic has given us great opportunity to connect around the world on continuing to have these discussions. Um, the only problem with that is we're all in different time zones. And so uh, I was telling Vanessa that I just finished a panel discussion with the um, uh, Judicial Research Training Institute of Korea at 1 a.m. this morning. So, uh, so that's part of the challenge, but I think we can continue to um, build the capacity that uh, Nicholas was talking about by collaborating with each other and um, the work of the Athens Roundtable continues and hopefully um, we meet in person next year, Nicholas. And one of the topics that was raised during the Athens Roundtable was also the need for like peer exchange on actual AI case law and uh, how to foster exchange globally on specific use cases on challenges that are being exposed. Uh, do you have any thoughts as a training institution to, to be a leader in this way or to set up a network? Um, do you already encounter different judges addressing you with their specific use cases? and looking for counterparts or um, review partners in that sense? Um, I think that's a good uh, suggestion um, that uh, we can use the forum for Athens Writing Table to uh, uh, create that next step. I mean, I think that uh, Pratik mentioned and um, it's, it's a, a good initiative and there is um, UNESCO to, uh, con to continue to share that information and certainly the National Judicial College can um, help with serving as the repository and, um, and sharing that information. So that's a great idea, I thought. Uh, Nicolas, I see your hand is raised or? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. The kind of uh, shared resources, living repositories, so to speak, to help equip. Judges are uh, very competent and very capable if they have access to a living repository, if they move from education to training, then mobilize this knowledge within their local context, within their cases to be able to, well, exercise and discharge their duties. So creating those shared resources and curating them in a way that effectively build capacity and reinforce capacities to their benefit around the world is, is something that we, we care for and, and uh, stay tuned because I think this is one of the areas where the attention on table is going to, uh, to move towards to, to help create that capacity, not alone, not reinventing the wheel, not doing alone, but really building a community and working together with the main actors to, to deliver this kind of uh, resources. Yeah, thank you, Pratik. I see your hand is raised as well. 
Yeah, I think I just quickly want to chime in on this point as well. Uh, so I think what we're talking about uh, when we talk about the legal implications of AI, not only to have a repository, but one of the ideas is also to work with a community of lawyers uh, who will bring these cases and these uses to court. Uh, so that is also a community that needs to be incubated, or I, I believe it already exists somewhere. But this is also a challenge where, we, as Nicola was mentioning before, uh, this dimension of principle to practice, this is what will also take us to practice, to take these cases and uses to court, uh, get new uh, orders and jurisprudence to emerge. I think that's another aspect to look at. Yeah, thank you. Nicola, is your hand raised again or is that still? Yeah, I think okay. a very important point on that is to reconnect with what I said at the beginning. What falls into uh, the laps on, of judicial operators oftentimes is uh, to resolve issues that pertain also to self and soft uh, regulation mechanisms. For example, uh, procurement guidelines and compliance officers, the way in which policies decided at the board level in a company and are realized through compliance mechanisms and or procurement mechanisms and the lack of respect of those can fall down as well on the uh, on, on the docket somewhere. So it's not at times it's done by the regulatory, at times it's done by the adjudicatory, but creating practices to both equip a judicial operator and relieve them from some of the things, because it's going to be much easier, much easier, better said than done, but it should be easier to resolve these matters when there are their standards for procurement and for compliance, rather than leaving judicial operators to the wild, wild west of, of no self, no soft regulation, where they are confronting themselves to the world of uncertainty. We really need to, you know, if we want hard regulatory mechanisms to be smarter, we have and corporates, corporations and professionals need to develop these tools and practices of self and soft regulation. Otherwise, we shouldn't be surprised that we end up with hard regulation that over-specify in less agile environment. It's really those cocktails and tools to, to, to exercise and implement those cocktails. Uh, Vanessa, you're, you're on mute, but I saw... Oh, sorry. Yes, sorry, Fatik. I was yeah. Um, yeah, seeing but, your hand but, raised again, so please but, go ahead. While we are on this question of standards, I think it's also interesting to point out uh, soft uh, regulation is uh, also helpful because technology is evolving. So in a lot of the, 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 law, the legal issues, which are the legislative aspects which are emerging, they are putting pinning it with standards. So you can update the standards uh, while you provide a guideline. So I think in that sense, also standards are important uh, going forward. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so maybe just uh, Isabella and Nicola to, to um, reiterate on the Athens Roundtable that is currently taking place. Um, you aim at achieving a form of call for action to answer the question really like, how can we tell the difference between AI that can be trusted and an AI, AI that cannot be trusted um, to advance justice? Um, could you maybe share your answer if you have one to this question? Whoever Is wants it, to go yeah, first. Isabella, please, please go first because last year you gave, a, you gave a very powerful call to action, very inspirational call to action. So, and you, you are the practitioner. Thank you. So I think that we, when we make this line between what we can trust and what we cannot trust, we're, we're in, first of all, taking into consideration how much information we have on that tool. So I think that we should start understanding the basics of AI operation. Uh, I can't, I, I could come here and tell you that AI needs to be transparent, that AI needs to be accountable, but how can AI be transparent? How can AI be fully accountable? It's impossible when we understand how algorithms really work, at least algorithms that adopt artificial intelligence. So I think that we should start with how do they work and what can I ask? developers regarding transparency. Why are they using decision trees? Can they, use, can they use decision trees that are tools that are much more transparent than neural networks? Is it possible for this situation? So we need to understand the basics and we need to demand 
transparency as possible, accountability as possible, and we need to understand also the point of discrimination, the point of bias. So I would highlight these two big challenges, the opacity that is inherent at some point, and then we must discuss what can we do to understand what is happening, and we need to highlight the point of discrimination that sometimes is something that has to do with the way the algorithm is programmed, but sometimes it has only to do with the data you use. And when you start understanding these mechanisms, you can start having productive discussions, discussions that will take you forward. And besides that, besides understanding and being able to exchange ideas in this field, I think that we need to ask ourselves, where can we make mistakes? We can't make mistakes in criminal law. We can't make mistakes with freedom of people. So where is a safe space to use AI? I can use AI in very different ways, even in the legal system. In Brazil, in the judiciary, we use AI to do very different things, to understand that if, if there is a, a lawsuit that is being repeated, to, to find um, precedents to be applied, to help judges with searches. We could also use it to make decisions or to suggest decisions or to, to, to make risk assessments. But we will do that. Where can AI help us in a safe place and where should we leave the work to judges? For me, these are like the basic questions. What do you think about that, Nicholas? Well, let me build upon what you've said and, and reframe the question that, uh, or frame again the question that Vanessa asked. How can we tell the difference between an AI that can be trusted and an AI that cannot advance justice? Quoting you, uh, Isabella, of last year. Well, the three pillars of the Athens Roundtable are policies, competence, and standards. And if you consider AI as social technical systems and judicial operators engulfed into these social technical systems, if you want to equip them to discharge their duties properly in a way that create trust, you know, without benchmarking standards, I gave the example of electronic discovery, but you can, you know, Isabella gave another one. We need those. Otherwise, companies are making claims that are not substantiated in an objective way. This has to stop. We need to move beyond that into a more objective measurement including metrology and benchmarking protocol. And that is done through standards. And then like the MOOC is doing, competence. You know, really equipping judges and judicial operators with the capacity to know when to mobilize what. Like uh, Isabella said, if you want to mobilize a black box on uh, very high risk uh, cases which endanger liberty or, or life, I mean, come on, I mean, maybe not. Uh, maybe you have to, but at least you take your decision in, uh, in a way with the due knowledge and you exercise wisdom. And last but not the least, policies and a set of policies from how courts are operated up to how boardrooms are operated and companies are operated. So to create trust requires that. Without that, we will not create these cocktails of self, soft and hard regulating mechanisms along with the tools to do that. That's a uh, that's, uh, that's the price to pay for trust. It will not happen in one day, but, but the good news is that AI, in fact, is not yet there. It's just a bit there. It's so unevenly distributed and the potential to create opportunities and manifest risk is not yet there. So that's what we're trying to do to anticipate when in parallel, the industrial age of AI is building up. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting discussion so far. Um, moving from the need for capacity building on AI for judicial operators to AI systems already being implemented in justice systems to challenges of AI and justice systems and now lately the question of standardization and trust um, on digital technology. Thank you very much. I would now like to open the floor for questions from the audience and I have seen that there was one remark of Ursula Machlewitz um, I don't know if you would like to take the floor to address a question or statement um, on regulation of intellectual property that you made.
you want to read it large, shall we? Can everyone maybe see the? Because it's a long one. It's a long question. Exactly. What? That's why I thought it might be nice to have somebody voicing it. If not, we can make it also an open um, an open statement and see if any one of you would like to comment on the question of artificial intelligence regulation in terms of intellectual property rights. Is that something that you have came across and what do you think of it? I can give a stab at it. And, and, okay. yeah. I, can, I can start saying yeah. something. It's not my field. I have a good friend that is an expert in that. She's a judge in intellectual property. But the point of start and, and the, the, the difficulty is that we understand that a creation is something that a human being does. Human being, a human being creates. So when you register something, you are the person that is the inventor. And with AI, we're seeing that some things are being created by algorithms like perfumes, perfumes. It's something that's so sensitive and algorithms are creating perfumes, they are creating songs, they are creating, they are painting, they are creating new paintings based on the previous paintings of famous painters. So it's something that you look and you say, okay, so if an algorithm has created a perfume, who is the owner of this creation? Is the algorithm, but, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't help the, 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 the laws that we have today, they do not protect inventions from algorithms or invention from inventions from animals, for example. And then you think, but okay, if it's not the algorithm, who is? Is it a programmer? But an algorithm is made of serious, of several algorithms. So are all the, the programmers, what, what we do with that? So this is one of the fields of law that needs to be rethought. We need to rethink about intellectual property in light of these new situations that we're living with technology. And this is something that is, is it's a phenomenon that it's not, that does not regard only intellectual property. When we talk about civil liability, and we, we have already talked about autonomous cars. Okay, if an autonomous car uh, run over someone, who is the responsible? It's the owner of the car, it's the developer of the car, it's the developer of the algorithm that was embedded in the car. So we have now thousands of questions without answers. And each time more, there's spaces of discussions, they will be needed. Because if in law, we're used to looking at a book to look for an answer of a problem that exists, now, with AI, we, we are pretty aware that we have no answers. So this is the beauty and the beast of AI, to, to, to use the title of a speech that I gave on Victor. This is the beauty and the beast. We're, we're in this situation. So I'm just like reframing what Ursula pointed out in her comment. And the, my, my answer is, I don't know. I think that we need to discuss everything in all of those topics. But we don't have um, answers that we can give immediately. And this is a challenge for judges. We're so used to having all the answers and now we just have all the questions. Thank you. Nicola, would you like to add on this? Oh, <laughs> Everything has been said. Okay, perfect. I see that we have two more questions on the chat and I would uh, encourage us to answer these or address these at least. Um, first one from Evgeny Tonkik. What is your vision on priority under this way? Regulatory versus standardization. It seems to be more easy, quick to establish some rules policy regulation rather than standards. Second one is more long terms anyway. What do you think? Maybe Nicola, you can start. That's a, that's a great question. It's a really good question, and uh, and it's uh, it's it's difficult to answer because uh, both are long if they are to be well developed. Let me give you an example: the General Data Protection Regulation (GDPR), Europe. It took well seven years, 
to develop this hard regulation. And then there was a delay in two years between uh, adoption to enforcement from 21st May uh, 2018. And now only we're getting a bit of feedback in terms of the implementation. So what is sure is that legislation takes time to materialize and uh, oftentimes it lags behind technology, not always. Um, and and uh, But it's, I agree that standards take a lot of time too. Why? Because a standard is the answer to the, an industrial requirements. You really need a standard when you move from innovation to industrial practice, when it's about disseminating across markets and societies. And for a good startup to emerge, you need enough competition, enough adoption, and enough understanding in terms of what are we trying to, what kind of incentives are we trying to create. And, and then uh, it's not one standard, it's standards, plural, which are also there to reflect industrial and political economies, you know, Americans versus Europeans versus Chinese. So there's also this political economic reality that has to be accounted for. And that's why at the core, what we're doing at the Athens Roundtable is trying to create bridges across the Atlantic to decide or to help decide over what do we mean by interoperable uh, standards? What do we mean by converging international conventions on the end human rights? Not everything has to be singular you need also to beg diversity to you know uh, render justice to the notion of self-determination for example and pluralism so these questions are not easily at all uh, defined and answered um, and uh, in my view at this stage we need to advance things in parallel and if you look at the eu ai act as an example what the eu AI Act is trying to do is exactly that meaning trying to advance a hard law instrument at the same line having delegated to SENSENELEC, the European Standardization Institute, or body, so to speak, the, the requirement to develop a set of standards to render this legislation smarter in avoiding over-specification of what lands into the, uh, the law, as opposed to what is left to communities of practice, professional practice. That's, I hope it answers your question. Uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the way I would uh, take the EUA Act example. Maybe the last question that is in the chat is also more directed towards uh, you, Nicola, since you are the one based in Europe for now. Um, to which extent do regulations which address automated processing of personal data, such as the Council of Europe Convention 108, already give relevant guidance? It's building a bit on um, your previous statement. Well, international regulation part or international public law uh, is, uh, is, is confronting a problem not only one problem, but one problem vis-a-vis -vis that. When you set up an international instrument, you always are confronting the, the question of what do you over-specify, what do you under-specify, why? Because to become law that a, a judge can really implement uh, in court, an international instrument has to be translated into national law and can be fair and has to be filtered, therefore, into national law following the adjudicatory, regulatory, or administrative routes. And, and it creates room for dilution, room for adaptation, which is potentially uh, problematic. And so one question that the Council of Europe will have to resolve in developing the International Convention on the End Human Rights is developing right now, is if we want this convention to have teeth and to be able to be implemented, do you need to go as far as over-specifying it to ensure that you avoid the risk of dilution, but at the, at the risk of minimizing pluralism? So it's really this, this debate over that. And uh, I don't know, I'm not an expert enough in, in specifically the 108 plus to analyze, but certainly what my view, what the Council of Europe and Kahai should be doing is take the Budapest Convention and 108 plus and do a benchmarking of exactly that. Look at after implementation, what has been the implementation on the ground and what do we learn from that? in terms of what do we need to over-specify or under-specify to reunify uniformity of enforcement with pluralism according to local contexts. Thank you very much, Pratik. I will leave the last intervention to you before we close the session. Well, well I certainly didn't want to be the last one, but it was an interesting question on the on the, on the Council of Europe's convention. And uh, since uh, we know that they adopted the, the Kahai finally gave its report, which talks about uh, setting up an AI regulation from the Council of Europe as well. Uh, and they actually looked into this question of as to what is covered by 108 plus, and do they still need a separate AI regulation? And then they came up with the answer, yes, it definitely is needed because some of the categories and definitions with respect to AI themselves are not clear. AI processors, they introduce terms like AI subjects. Uh, so all this would also potentially go in the new uh, convention that they are proposing. 
and uh, it will it will be transversal not go into sector specific uh, as uh, similar to the previous convention so i think they've done this analysis now really it's what are the risk categories and what are the how, how do you first classify risk and then decide whether you want to follow a checklist like the eu commission's ai act is doing or you link it with standards uh, i think that is an interesting conversation as well going forward on the regulation aspect yes thank you very much and also thank you very much for the active participation of our audience even though it's a virtual hybrid event it makes it a bit harder to really interact but it was uh, very great to have your questions i think they were addressing a couple of um, blind spots so to say in the ai um, policy process and we thank you very much for this i will close the session now as we are one minute away from having our end time um, so I thank very much um, our speakers and you participants for this interesting and timely discussion on the impact of AI on the rule of law. As we have seen and discussed, the implications of AI on justice systems are manifold. And the forum also shows UNESCO's commitment, I hope, to enhance future-oriented reflections and foresight initiatives in respect of the challenges and opportunities of artificial intelligence on the rule of law. We at UNESCO will not stop our journey with our MOOC on AI and the rule of law with our member states. We will contextualize the impact of AI on justice systems at regional levels. We are engaging with judicial networks to make sure our judicial systems and actors are able to evaluate the challenges associated to AI. And I would highly encourage you to work together with us to mitigate the risks, to foster exchange and to work towards human rights-based rights approach of AI. On behalf of UNESCO, I thank you very much for following the 2021 IGF Roundtable on AI and the Rule of Law. And you will find in the chat also a link to the registration to our MOOC on AI and the Rule of Law in case you wish to sign up for the course starting in March 2021. And I really would like to take the opportunity to thank our partners in this course, the Future Society, the National Judicial College, and static.br uh, for supporting us in moving this forwards and for building capacities of judicial operators worldwide. Thank you very much. And I hope you have a great day at the IGF today. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.